guess while we're waiting, I'll just start with a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is Valerie Lockhart, and I do freelance uh, web and accessibility um, design, universal design projects, uh, application development, kind of a little bit of everything, video, photo, media in general. Um, and I also run the Minnesota Women in Tech group locally. Um, so we do monthly meetings about uh, all sorts of tech topics and things that are going on in the Twin Cities, uh, volunteer events. Uh, I do some work for a, an organization called Accessibility uh, that works locally to help people with barriers find work uh, and community inclusion. So a lot of my life is wrapped up in the concept of access to everything uh, and making things accessible for everybody to, no matter what their their barrier or situation is. So that's a little bit about me. Hi, my name is Catherine Lundoff and I have worked in different IT positions in different corporations around the Twin Cities for 17 years. Um, I got into tech when I was in my 30s, which makes me kind of unusual because there's not a lot of women left who, who A, last for 17 years and B, got into it that late. Um, I'm primarily not a developer, I do a range of things. Um, and Valerie and I started doing these presentations at Google Dev this year because we wanted to talk about the overlap of accessibility issues that both people with various kinds of disabilities run into as well as people who are older in tech fields, also known as nobody is 26 forever. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> There's that too, yes. <laughs> um, so we're, we're going to be alternating on slides here. So information technology, it's a, you know, a vast and diverse field, and there's a lot of different people working in it. We have a stereotype that it's all about startups, and startups are peopled by a certain kind of human being, and everybody looks like that, and not so much. Um, and you've got a whole bunch of different circumstances where people are living with impairment um, and there are workers who could be accommodated, there are people who you can sell products to, and there's a whole range of things that go into working to make things more accessible for uh, bringing unique perspectives to your business or your products. Uh, it's thought that about one billion people worldwide live with a disability and uh, with all of us aging, that increases all the time. Um, as we all know, there is a huge spectrum of abilities, and completely ignoring a whole section of people is not okay for any business uh, or company or group. <laughs> uh, it's just broadening our perspective on who we're, who we can deal with. Some of the more common impairments that uh, we see people facing, blindness, impaired vision, uh, deafness, hearing, impaired hearing, limited mobility. Uh, a lot of times people that have severe disabilities don't leave their homes. So uh, the internet and technology become their window to the world. Uh, and when we don't design things that they can utilize easily, we're leaving them out of that very fast-paced uh, growth as a, as a, a group. Um, and then autism, uh, the gentleman that just spoke before us kind of talked about uh, joking um, and kind of situations like that. There's a lot of times that people that are on the autism spectrum, they don't understand that you're joking or uh, have that recognition of sarcasm or anything like that. So there's just differing abilities that people have and we have to be conscious of that to, to work together. So. Okay, and a little bit about aging in IT. The really interesting thing is when you go looking for information about aging in IT, especially if you are looking for information about people in any minority group, is that most of the information is largely anecdotal. So in a broad sweeping way, this is what the US Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates the labor market to look like in IT as of two years ago. And you notice that there is a really substantial drop off 
when you start getting into 45 and older, and it drops off pretty abruptly from there. Um, for context, we are still talking about a skills gap. I'm just saying. <laughs> so there's a number of barriers that people face to both getting hired on and getting retained in IT workplaces. Um, some of these are cultural barriers. Some of them overlap for both people with disabilities and older workers. And these include things like assumptions <laughs> that being um, younger and being able-bodied is better and cheaper that older workers are more expensive or on the brink of retirement. Like anyone can afford to retire. But anyway, <laughs> just kidding. Um, older workers have old irrelevant skills, and you'll hear this one a lot. Um, older workers and workers with disabilities require too much accommodation and it's going to be too difficult. And that older workers are resistant to change. Uh, there are ways that companies and organizations can uh, get past all that wrong thinking <laughs> and realize that we are all capable of many things and that with tech, we can become more uh, inclusive because we can make accommodations easier and cheaper and uh, faster. So uh, just giving some, uh, Remote working is one that I think of a lot. Uh, the more we increase the opportunities for that, the more accommodating we're gonna be. Um, the hours and flexibility piece of working, uh, a lot of companies think that they, I know we're getting away from this thought, but uh, they think it, you have to be here from eight to five and no breaks and you have to be plugged to your desk and you can't walk away and you can't or, you know, take a break. Uh, those ways have to go away if we're going to be productive and be inclusive. People with certain mental health problems need certain accommodations. They're excellent workers. They just might need to take a break every once in a while, a longer break, and kind of recharge and regroup and come back. It doesn't mean they're less productive. It just means that you need to accommodate a different kind of work style for them. Um, and then physical, physical accommodations as well, like not making everybody have the same kind of desk or letting people stand or, you know, work standing up or sitting down or in a different kind of environment. Uh, I, one thing that I always run into in my workplaces is the fluorescent lighting. Uh, it gives me incredible headaches, but there's a lot of places that you can't turn those off or, you know, they don't let you have that kind of control over your lighting situation. So. Just little things like that to keep in mind, especially on the employer side. Uh, little changes like that can make a huge difference and can make it very, much easier for you to get more productivity out of your employees. <laughs> uh, oh. okay. uh, this one, this slide is specifically, we give kind of a longer, we've given a longer talk on more web accessibility topics. Uh, this is more about like, and it, it applies to any project that you're working on, but these are kind of the things that, the rules that I go by uh, for considering accessibility in a product or a project or a group. Um, keeping personas in mind, trying to keep it as vast as possible, um, considering all kinds of users or people that will interface with your, your project or your, your company. Um, and being extreme in those, in those things so that you're capturing different perspectives of how people might engage with you. Um, considering the age of the user and how uh, just because someone's getting older doesn't mean that they are irrelevant. Uh, considering the race and culture of the people that will be engaging with your project or your company, uh, not to be insensitive to those things, words that you use might mean a different thing in a different language or a different culture. Uh, considering gender, usually the way I try to be safe is just to be gender neutral because in most situations, there's no need to even call it out. Uh, and then considering the income and the buying power of your users, we want to make places and projects and things that are accessible to everybody and price point is a huge thing to consider. You don't want to price people out of being able to engage with your product or your company or, you know, if 
we need to make profits, obviously, to, to make a living, but you don't need to price people out in order to be sustainable, so. Okay, um, and we talked a little bit about some of the barriers that older workers face, and um, we wanted to include some information about why it's worthwhile to try and retain those workers. So, and some of it deals with experience with multiple systems and applications. And it's an opportunity to adapt tech to a more diverse range of users and to create better tech in the process. And I would say that this is definitely you know, also part of making tech accessible to, to everyone is that you get better stuff. And better stuff has a bigger market. Better stuff is, has a longer shelf life as well. Um, it's the ability to market applications and products to a wider audience. I'm noticing that AARP, for example, is talking more about hiring older workers for marketing because it's an untapped audience. Um, and frankly, older workers tend to stay put longer. The stereotype may be that people are just gonna bail to go and retire, but in general, those are people who, as long as they're getting treated well, will stay put at a job. And if your average tech worker is staying at a job for two to three years, you get somebody who's gonna stick around for five or six, that's actually pretty good. So, uh, so that brings us to what we can do. Uh, commit to creating a diver diverse workplace. Uh, mentioned earlier, you know, creating a code of conduct that is inclusive and that everybody that works on your team agrees with and can and agree with and buy into, uh, that's gonna make a, a better environment. Uh, providing training options for all workers. So if someone needs something visually versus auditorily, uh, just making different accommodations. And with the new with new software that's out there, it's much easier to do those things. Uh, it doesn't cost a lot of money to get things translated to a different method. Uh, promoting mentoring to help older and younger workers work and learn together. Uh, as older workers leave the environment, they take with them a huge source of tribal knowledge that they may not have transferred or had the ability to transfer to younger workers. So allowing mentoring and group work that way uh, can help transfer some of that knowledge that gets lost as people leave the workforce. Um, and then not pre-screening older workers from the application process. Um, I've worked in HR for a lot of years and I've seen a lot of people that are like, oh, this person graduated in this year, we don't need to talk to them. So uh, taking some of that stuff off of resumes is a good, <laughs> a good way to kind of anonymize your, your existence and ha let you have a more equal playing field. Uh, it's sad that we have to do it, but until there's a massive change in hiring practices, uh, I fully support anonymizing your information as much as possible. Um, and then don't assume that a skill can't be transferable. There's many different ways to get jobs done. Okay, and finally, of course, a reminder that technology is for everyone. And Valerie's put a contact up for Minnesota Women in Tech for those of you who are local. Um, and that's my, my Twitter feed, so you get me. Full, the full effect of the contents of my brain, which is a little scary, <laughs> but there it is. Um, I should mention, we also have a resource list, but due to operator error, me, um, I, I kind of didn't run it off in print. And um, so I'll be posting it, and I'll tag it, and I'll give it to Ash to link in whatever way you normally link to conference documents so we can get that out there. So that will be available after this talk and it includes some links to different articles. Um, I should mention that Model View Culture has a great series on accessibility and tech, and it's linked on the accessibility tag, and you can see a whole bunch of different things in there, and I recommend that too. And we, we do longer meetings and, and kind of uh, meetups and learning sessions about a lot of this stuff. Um, there's been this looming rule over the last few years that the Department of Justice is going to make all websites have to be accessible. Uh, they keep prolonging that, so nobody has to comply with it yet, uh, but it's coming, and so learning about how to make the web accessible is gonna be super important. It already is, but legally speaking, it will be more important for everyone to understand a little bit more about it. So.
All right, thank you thank all very you. much, and thank you. So you guys kind of talked about employers being um, resistant to making accommodations um, for employees. For example, I have uh, a coworker, he's in his mid-40s-ish, gets terrible migraines from overhead lights. I sometimes get back pain from sitting in a desk all day. How do you kind of approach those conversations of why it's beneficial for myself, for my coworker and the company to make those kind of changes? So it, uh, it's unfortunate that we even have to like demand it, but you have to just demand it. Like ask for what you need, um, find solutions for them. Like bring, don't just bring the problem to them, bring a solution. Say like, you know, I could, if we can kill this banister of, of fluorescence, I have this lamp that I can put on my desk. You know, there's little things like that, but if you don't expect them to solve the problem for you, I guess I would say like, bring your ideas for accommodation um, and, and work with them to try to, to try to make it work. They're mostly going to be concerned about two things, the cost of what you're asking for and how it's gonna make everybody else in the office feel. <laughs> so if you can address those two things with your proposal, I, w I think you'll have a better, a better uh, chance at them working with you. They should. They um, being painfully persistent is also really good. Um, I have scent allergies and getting my the corporation I work at to implement any sort of scent policy has been a long uphill and painful battle. Um, you can get there, but you got to know that you're going to get smacked down the first couple of times, unfortunately, unless you're working someplace that's really cool. So it does take some work, which which is really a drag. It shouldn't, but but you do get there eventually, and we have a scent policy. <laughs> one, one of the things that, and this may be an incorrect theory on my part, but I'm, so I'm maybe curious as to your thoughts, but uh, you know, a lot of the things you talked about around age d deal with uh, employer discrimination, uh, which, which I think obviously is extremely valid. But I also wonder, especially in our tech industry where people uh, have tended always to be younger and do a lot of job hopping and so their salaries or income is constantly climbing at a compared to most industries a ridiculous rate um, and then you hit an age like you know in your mid 40s or something and realize that you can't be you can't continue to get 10 to 20 percent raises every two years um, I wonder how much of that that critical drop off in the uh, uh, census data uh, is because people that hit my age, for example, um, all of a sudden go, huh, in order to make more money, I have to leave IT and go into business. Um, and, and so we, we lose an awful lot of great minds and a lot of great wisdom. And, and I'm not, you know, just because I think we're, in my opinion, we're an immature industry and people just haven't yet figured out that you do in fact plateau. Um, you know, pr all other professions plateau and people end up kind of cruising the last decade of their life or of their career um, making essentially the same amount of money. Um, but we don't seem to accept that. I, I don't know if that's valid or maybe, maybe I'm just full of it, but it's a thought. No, I, th I think that's a, that's a really good point. Um, that's a really good several points. Um, I think what I've found anecdotally and this... We started doing this as a result of an article that I wrote for Model View Culture on Aging and IT. And I was specifically looking at you know, women and non-binary gender people of whom I know very few in IT and none in my workplace, but they're out there. Um, but just talking about you know, how long people last in the field, because, we ha because it is a very new industry, comparatively speaking, so there's not a lot of role modeling that shows that you can be in this for a long time and be successful. So yes, a lot of people roll off into other fields. People roll off into starting their own businesses. Um, I do run across a lot of people who just can't get back in once they get laid off. You know, they, they get cut because they're suddenly too expensive for whatever reason. They get cut because the company decides to outsource any of the other delightful things that happen in corporate industry. A lot of those people end up working for nonprofits and for smaller shops, which is something I don't think that the, the Department of Labor really talks about. Um, but most of, for example, the older women I know who are still developers and have been developers for 30, 40 years 
all work for nonprofits or they work for government entities. And they get pushed out of the more corporate industry because there's so much emphasis on you know, being young and being a certain kind of young and what, that, what goes with that. Yeah, the young that can work 80 hours a week, and that's you know that's that's a valid you know thing to consider. Um, but so I think that you know it, it's looking at the industry also in terms of non-coding jobs because that's the other thing I see when I look at a lot of the current diversity in tech um, efforts. They're very very focused on coding and just coding. Now. If you had asked me when I first got into the field and I was like 33 or so, if my dream in life was to sit around and look at what was something close to binary at that point, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, what got me in, interested and engaged in IT was language-based programming. So SQL, SQL is my first love. I fell madly in love with SQL because it was a way to talk to, to programs. And I loved that, it was great, but it was something that worked the way my mind worked, so it made sense to me. Um, so you get kind of, you know, a push where, you know, people in, in, in real life off the page, we know that people go from being developers to being project managers to being analysts to being user experience experts to being all these different kinds of things, doing different kinds of consulting work. But on the page, what we see is if you are in IT, you are a coder and you fit this, this checklist of, of characteristics. So I think it's also kind of important to, to break out of how we think about IT and how we think about tech and the tech workforce as well.